Three, two, one. I'm a good boy. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the third Eurovision Hub podcast with me, Miho. And with me, Louis. Louis. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Louis, podcast three already. Can you believe it? It seems like literally only yesterday that we decided on doing podcasts and um, now look. I know this has been such a fast year in my life. I've done so much. I finished uni, started masters, embarked on so many projects just like this one. <laughs> No, Lou, I know that you've got a really controversial topic that you insist on bringing up with me, and you have been since last year. Wait, which one are you talking about? Brexit. Ah, yes. You see, I have a lot of thoughts and opinions about things like this. Politics, world news. It's always great to share them and hear other people's thoughts on the matter. Yeah, well, that's why I never really spoke about it to you before this moment, because I thought... It's quite a good topic to talk about on a podcast and I'm um, not over a latte in Costa. You've kept me waiting nearly a year to find out your thoughts on Brexit. We know that the UK are leaving Europe, but should they also leave Eurovision? There were so many fears that the UK would not be allowed to enter the Eurovision Song Contest after Brexit, weren't there? It was so stupid. Even before the vote to leave the European Union, the former Prime Minister David Cameron had to reassure the fans of the Eurovision and he said something like, I think that it would not only be very sad, but I think given that Israel and Azerbaijan and anyone near Europe seems to be able to enter, even Australia, so I think that we're safe. Um, all participating countries must be a member of the European Broadcasting Union, which the BBC is, so I think that all of the fears were just for the headlines. In my opinion, the UK's chances in the Eurovision Song Contest are unlikely to be affected by leaving the EU. A song is a song at the end of the day. The UK are just as likely to do well or badly inside the EU as they are outside. Plus, if you look at the history of the Eurovision, you'll see that almost half of all the winners in the past 61 years have not actually been in the EU or its predecessor, the European Economic Community. What about you though? Well, yeah, I agree. A song is a song. But I also think you need to look at how things are changing. We have all these new countries from outside the geographical borders of Europe, as it were the likes of Australia, Turkey, even possibly Kazakhstan. The competition is much higher now, and there are more countries competing, and may I add, putting in decent songs as well. Yes, the UK were very successful in the olden days, the competition, they won five times, but their last win was 1997, and since then, they've just been a frequent member of the bottom half of the table, bar three or four exceptions. I just think that the UK may be needed financially, but not musically anymore. So, Australia are back for the third year in a row, Louis. It's been confirmed that we will see them in Lisbon. SBS, the Australian broadcaster, is not actually an active member of the EBU, but an associate member. Therefore, the 2018 host broadcaster, RTP, which is the Portuguese broadcaster, and the EBU have extended an invite to the Australian broadcaster in order to join the competition in Lisbon. What do you think? Well, now I don't know about you, But since 2015, I constantly get people asking me, Oh, Louis, can you explain why Australia in the Eurovision? (laughs) And after an eye roll and a sigh, I try to think about the least complicated way of putting it. So, for anyone who also wants to know this, listen up. (coughs) So, the Eurovision has been broadcast down under for more than 30 years. The Australian broadcaster, SBS, is an associate member of the EBU, and in 2015, to mark the 60th Eurovision Song Contest, they were invited to submit an entry. In 2016, the broadcaster requested to take part in the Eurovision Song Contest again, and the reference group, which is the governing body of the Eurovision Song Contest, they all voted unanimously in favour of Australia's participation in both 2016 and 2017. It is yet to be decided if Australia are going to become a permanent participant. Did you know that until recently, associate members of the EBU were not eligible for participation? Well, despite the Australian exception. But in the new wording, this has changed. The new rules state that <clears throat> associates of the EBU may also be eligible to enter the Eurovision Song Contest. This is decided by the reference group, the governing body of the Eurovision Song Contest, on a case by case basis. Yes, so that's actually really exciting. It is. I mean, I know it's old news, but unless you're a member of the Eurovision fandom, you would never really have known that. 
So this means that we will probably more than likely see new countries in the contest over the next couple of years. It does indeed. And I think that one of the first new countries that we'll see, well, apart from Australia's debut in 2015, is Kazakhstan. So rumours about Kazakhstan participating have been increasing so much over the past year. And their broadcaster is an associate member of the EBU, like Australia. Therefore, who knows what will happen? So other countries that have an associate membership, like Australia they might get a chance to participate uh, due to the new regulation. These include the likes of Iran, China, Canada, Syria, United States, South Korea, and only to name a few. I love when we get new countries at Eurovision, we all. Me too. And I remember when I went to Eurovision for the first time in 2006, it was held in Athens with my mum. And Armenia was debuting and everyone was just so excited. They were so supportive and so welcoming to them. Their song was unreal that year. It was called Without Your Love. They arrived to the contest with a bang and they blew the competition out of the water, in my opinion. It was one of my favourites that year. Yeah, I actually remember that. I loved that song. Their staging was great too. All the ropes and their fancy footwork. Yeah. You know what debut I didn't like though? (laughs) What? Azerbaijan, 2008. What did we all do to deserve that? I know. I mean, I wanted them to be in it so badly, but I wouldn't warm to their screeching tones that only dogs really could have heard with the mix of rock. Luckily, they redeemed themselves in 2009 and 2010, actually. Still the best entries they've sent so far. Yeah, I agree. So, to summarise then, Lou, what debuts would you like to see at the contest over the next, let's say, 10 years? Oh, the next 10 years? I don't know. I, I would see 200 countries in this competition. But to narrow it down, I'd like to see maybe the likes of Brazil, Egypt, China... You know, those countries would all bring these very different and unique approaches. I'd also like to see places that aren't necessarily seen as countries. You know, Northern Ireland, maybe uh, an entry from the Catalans. That would be great as well, do you not think? I'd like to see Wales or Scotland take part as individual entries because, you know, Wales actually took part in the 2017 edition of the Eurovision Choir of the Year and they came second. And I've also heard the Welsh national broadcaster, S4C, has been encouraged to take part in the Junior Eurovision Song Contest as well, so I'd like to see Wales or Scotland there. Also, I'd love to see entries from the other EBU countries like Algeria, Libya, Tunisia. We've talked a lot about new countries and how amazing it would be, and that's all good and well, but what if they turn up and don't produce the goods? What do you mean, if they don't produce the goods? Like, don't bring good songs or something? Yeah, exactly. We already have enough lazy countries who, in my opinion, just about get by your vision. We don't need any more countries to take part just for the fact that they can take part. <laughs> Lazy countries. Who are you talking about, Lee? Well, Come on. I mean, Macedonia, they're just really poor. Montenegro, they've failed to qualify like they're seven out of nine times. Um, Czech Republic, are just they were poor before their Eurovision sabbatical and then came back even worse. And although I personally loved them this year, Sam Reno just can't really catch a break. <laughs> Whoa, no. I have to agree. I do agree that some countries appear like they don't actually care through their dated entries or their performances or underproduced songs or lack of innovation or even lack of competitiveness when it comes to the competition. It's like they turn up expecting even just to qualify and they're taking part, like you said, just because they can or for the sake of it and it's a bit of fun or or just kind of a week away for the team. Change of scenery, something like that. But I have to say that I only feel like that about a small amount of countries, but the countries I'm talking about, I think that they should exploit the opportunity. I mean, come on, this is the Eurovision Song Contest, watched by 204 million people. This is the most non-watched sporting event in the world. So why does your song sound like it's 10 years too late, your staging dull and disengaging, and your singer look like a deer caught in headlights? Exactly. So, da-da-da, can we kick them out? (laughs) What? <laughs> we can't just kick them out. This, no. See, I think that the best thing that happened to the Eurovision Song Contest rules was the semi-finals and the no automatic qualification if you placed in the top ten the year before, because it only made countries stop and think like, "Whoa, there's a chance that we might not actually appear in the grand final next year." So, um, I think they started to step up. What do you think? Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. But I think if they don't step up enough, the EBU should have some sort of system in place for which countries that don't step up and they get banned for maybe like a year or two. Well, I don't mean banned, but like a formal warning maybe and saying, look, step it up here next year. Or maybe why don't the EBU send out 
their own verified non-biased artists to help countries work on songs. Surely a more evenly matched competition would be good for the EBU as well. Why don't we even ask the countries who I want to compete? Why are you here? Like, do you want to win? Because I'm being honest here. I don't think a lot of countries would be, oh yeah, I'm coming here to win the competition. A lot of them won't say that. Okay, so for example, Ireland in 2017 failed to qualify for the fourth year in a row. Mm. How do you imagine this system working in Ireland's case? Like, would they be banned or... Because having a bad entry ultimately comes down to a person's taste. And me and you know all too well about having different tastes. You'd be banning the countries with songs that I like. And I know for a fact I'd be saying bye to all of your favourites. Yeah, well, that's the problem with music. And ultimately, it is all based on opinions and your own taste. And our last podcasts actually talk about our own taste and all our favourite and most hated songs. But that's the sad truth. There is no computer programme to define the success of a song. In real life, that's outside the Eurovision fan bubble. Mm -hmm. A band or a solo artist releases a song. People think it's good. They buy it. If they don't, then maybe the artists need to rethink their style, maybe rethink their career, come back with something different. You know, some people need to have a push in the right direction. Yeah, but do you think it would work? Because look at Portugal in 2017 from an extremely poor history of results. Came the biggest Eurovision win ever. They scored the most points ever by a Eurovision winner. They hadn't qualified since 2010. They took a break in 2013 and 16, which were coincidentally both when Eurovision was held in Sweden. Anyway, conspiracy. My thoughts are that they had a think about things in 2016 and they just came back with a fresh new approach and boom, they won. Wait, why didn't they participate in Sweden? Because they didn't take part in 2000 either, and that was in Stockholm. Louis, out of everything I just said, I knew that you were going to pick up on that. Come on. Wait, but it is interesting, though. It is interesting, but let's save that conspiracy for another podcast. Okay, well, back to the topic. Yeah, that's my point, exactly. Portugal took a break. Maybe they really sat down and said, look, let's think about this and come back and try and nail it and get a win. I know what you're going to say. Yeah, some countries take breaks all the time, and that might be political or economy related but most of the time they aren't working on a winning formula for their eurovision song realistically countries are going to keep entering eurovision it could be america chile antarctica you name it and it's going to have to be like a football world cup format you know groups of six or seven and then with the top two qualify into a final that's Mm. the way it's going down the future is coming you'll see Okay, so I have some amazing trivia for you this week based on our topics. Okay, let's get to it. Okay, so can you tell me what EBU members have never entered the Eurovision? Even though they're fully eligible, they've just they've just never taken the opportunity. Uh, you mentioned this before. I should have paid more attention. You should have, yep. Um, <laughs> okay, well, I know Vatican City because that's an interesting one. Okay. And I know Algeria and Jordan, but I forget the rest. <laughs> okay, so, so can you remind us? EBU members have never entered the Eurovision even though they're fully eligible. So you've said Vatican City. Come try guess. Um is Egypt is Egypt in there? Yeah. Um I said Algeria is definitely in there. Mm-hmm. And Jordan says beside. I'm missing one, am I? Okay, okay. So I'll just tell you. So the EBU members who have never entered the Eurovision Song Contest, even though they're fully eligible to enter, are Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Libya, and the Vatican City. Oh, not too bad. Come on, guys. We welcome you with open arms. Anyway, my turn. After Portugal's win in 2017, you said they weren't very successful. The country waiting longest for its first win is now Malta, who have been competing since 1971, followed by Cyprus and Iceland. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you were just telling me a fact? Well... Yeah. Okay, so my last piece of trivia for you. I said earlier that Portugal set the record this year for the most points received ever by a Eurovision winner. But before Salvador took that title, who had it before? Fairy tale. Alexander Rybak. That would be correct if this was any time before the 2016 oh. contest. So, Jamala. Yep. Ah, great. <laughs> Obviously, okay. Obviously, an overall ranking is flawed as older contests had different point systems and less countries were voting. But yeah, before Portugal, Ukraine had the title. So yeah, silly point systems changing history yet again. Yep. 
And that comes into my last piece of trivia. Okay. On silly point changes. So, scoring zero used to be so demoralising and even embarrassing sometimes. But with the new folding system, the chances of scoring zero are greatly reduced. Although, in theory, it's still possible. Mm -hmm. So, there's chances out there. It has happened. However, which two debutantes received zero on their first outing? Debutantes? What a word. Um... Do you, do you have a clue? Do you want the... No, I think I might know this, actually. Two. Hungary and Portugal. <clears throat> you were right with Portugal in 1964. S- Cyprus? No. Mm-hmm. Iceland? No. Norway? No. Finland? No. Armenia? No. Germany? No. <laughs> nah, I don't know. Lithuania, 1994. Oh, of course. Why didn't I guess that? Okay. That was the year I was born, so I didn't remember. Me neither, I was too. So now it's that part of the show where it is our time for... (laughs) No, let's try that again. So now it's part of the show where it's our favourite game. Guess the... (laughs) I'll do it. Okay, guys, so it's the part of the show that we like to call... Guess Guess the the intro. intro. So, like we always say, it still works. We get it all the time. It's pretty self-explanatory. We're going to play the first 10 seconds of a Eurovision song from the past. And we're going to have to guess the intro. So, Louis, you're up first. Up alone. Um, that's 2016. I remember listening to it. It's Cyprus. But I can't... Uh, alter ego or something is it that was fast good for you okay, yep I'm you're correct there. I've been doing my work yeah minus one alter ego Cyprus 2016 oh Luckily, I got just that kind of riffing. Um, that is also 2016, Russia. Mm-hmm. It's You Are The Only One. What do you think about that song? Yeah, I actually did really like it, but I never understood why it wasn't called Thunder and Lightning, because that's the only lyric that I always remembered. Thunder and lightning, it's getting exciting. This is an absolute chin. I love this, you know. Did you? I actually, I wanted to win. No, I didn't want it to I win. Don't. <laughs> it was you take that positive. back right now. <laughs> it was definitely up there. I loved it. I think I just want to sing along to it. Go. But it's Lithuania, Eastern European funk. It sure is. Nailed it. Wait, that was three out of three for you, wasn't it? Oh, it was, yeah. Good on you. No pressure on you, because I'm going to pick some hard ones. Sure. Okay, I'm ready. Have we started with the difficult ones yet? This is Sweden 2001, Listen to Your Heartbeat. It sounds very much like ABBA, doesn't it? It sounds very Swedish, and that's why I love it. Fair, okay. One to me. Listen to your Are we getting difficult ones now? Yep. Um, I don't know what this one is. At all. At all. It's from 2002. Can I have a wee bit more? Um, For non-Irish listeners, wee means a little. Can I have a little bit more, please? Romania. 2002. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Romania 2002. (laughs) Yes, tell me why. Oh, I don't know that song. Can we listen to a bit of the chorus? Maybe I'll... Recognize it. Yeah. Tell me why we have to say goodbye. Was our love only a foolish lie? Mm. Not a very recognizable song. Not a very melody. recognizable song. There's maybe a reason why I don't know this one. <sighs> what? Okay. What? That's I got it. One out of two. Yeah. Last one.
Oh, I didn't want that to stop. That sounded nice. Doesn't that, that sound was... awfully familiar to the 2017 oh, it... winner? It does. I think it's just that romantic and nostalgic sound. Um, that is definitely an early one. That's like the late 50s or 60s or something. I've got no idea, but can I get a point for guessing the, that it's an old song? <laughs> Yes, uh, well, I'll give you the year, because you should know it from the year, because we talked about it earlier, 1964. Did we talk about this song? Mm-hmm. Portugal. This is Portugal's debut no. entry, 1964, and it got zero points. Did it deserve it? Let's listen to a little bit more. If I mean, that entered this year, that probably would have won probably as would. well. <laughs> I don't think it was 12 points, but it certainly wasn't zero. It wasn't. What uh, a journey it has been, 53 years later. Mm-hmm. So three actually... Two. Did you just win? I just won 3-2. Did two. you just... Mm. To be fair, you're picking easy ones for I, me, and yeah. I'm picking hard ones for you. You said it, not me. I was giving you a bit of an advantage there. Some, I wanted to build your confidence back up. There's some match fixing going on with Carline, the producer, next door. Okay, guys, so you may or may not know that Eurovision Hub has got three co-founders. Myself, Louis, but also a third, who we call producer Carline. And she's joining us today to answer some quick questions. Hey, Carline. <laughs> hey, welcome. So, just to start, Caroline, tell everyone how we know each other. Um, yeah, so we all went to school together. Um, Miho was a year above me, so he was a year below me, so I kind of bridged the gap um, between the two. Um, we were all very uh, musical orientated. Miho and Louie were slightly more... Um, what's the word? <laughs> what is the word? <laughs> the boys were a bit more lucky in their talents. Um, I had a little bit more difficulty getting kind of on the stage. I was more the girl behind the stage opening and closing the curtains. Aww. But that's okay. That's a really important job. But that's how we all know each other. So Caroline, how did we manage to get you involved with this Eurovision Hub project? You'd both approached me knowing that I'd been doing a bit of freelance work. I've been doing it for the last kind of five years. Um, so you knew exactly what kind of uh, industry I was in, but also the fact that I I had made my way up through a couple of different companies. Um, so I had a good background knowledge into startup companies and stuff like that. So I think you kind of thought I was the ideal person to help push your push your dreams and hopefully make them a reality. So we'll so let we you know had, where that goes. We had haunted you. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. We did well. Caroline, have you got a favourite Eurovision song or a moment that sticks out in your head from the past? The biggest memory that I have, um, or the memory that I just don't forget, is uh, Mia Hall used to host Eurovision parties, which I had never heard of until I was invited. Yeah. Um, and I was given a country, which was Denmark at the time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, were you really given it <laughs> in my head I have it that you you love the song and I was like great you're going to be Denmark I think it was more you knew who you wanted to be and didn't really care <laughs> but yeah so I was Denmark and the song was in a moment like this oh yeah as far as I'm aware they came fourth but Actually, Miho thought they came fifth, so for someone who's really big into European, you thought Ooh. he would have known that. Top five, top Ooh. five. <laughs> Caroline, Miho also lost to me in the game of Guess the Intro. But okay, I'm having a Miho, tough day, are you okay. Slacking? Are you slacking? I can feel a cold or something coming on, I don't know what it is. But before we actually started recording the podcast, we let Caroline listen to the song in a moment like this that um, she was supporting back then. And what did you think about it? Uh, it was like I'd never heard it before. <laughs> it was, again, it was, it was, it was like the first moment all over again, almost like I'd forgotten, but clearly I had not forgotten. <laughs> clearly I knew exactly who they were. Yeah, it's just all so new and fresh. Like Yeah, yeah. Like the first time literally all over exactly. again. Exactly, and that's what you want from a song. It you is. want it to be fresh. You don't want to remember it at all. <laughs> <laughs> you want it to be fresh every time you hear it. <laughs> Thanks very much, Caroline, for coming on. I'm sure it's not going to be the last time we see or hear from you on the show. Hopefully not. <laughs> it's been, a, we've had a great time. Have you had a good time? Yeah, definitely. That's great. And of course, as always, if you have any questions for any of us now, all three of us, 
please do send them. Yep, you can contact us on all of our social media sites by searching at Eurovision Hub, or you can email us as well at hello at eurovisionhub.com. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed watching and listening as much as we... In no. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed watching and listening as much as we enjoyed making this for you guys. Yeah, exactly what Louis said. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And if you agree or disagree with anything that we've discussed on the show this week, please let us know by contacting us on any of our social media platforms at Eurovision Hub. Before we end, we just want to say a huge thanks to everyone who's collaborated and worked with us over the last couple of months. It's been amazing to work with so many people and to share their talents. And with all your feedback, we know that we're not the only ones who love them. Over the next few weeks, you'll be able to get to know our team a bit more in depth, meeting our animators, our editors, reactors, bloggers and musicians. But in the meantime, let us know your favourite Eurovision Hub team member. And of course, there is always space here if you want to work for us. Just contact us. Until next time, bye. Bye, guys.